welcome to the webinar and thank you for being here. I know you're all very, very busy people, so it's wonderful that you found the time to come along. And it's a shame I can't actually see you, but at least I can see you in the chat going through. Now, the first thing we need to do is a little bit of housekeeping. Just make sure you turn off everything in the background, like Skype and email, iTunes, whatever your thing is, so that you minimize the possibility of being kicked out of the webinar. And if you do get kicked out, it's pretty simple. Um, just come back in again, go back to the same link and click on that and come back. Just something from my end, I've been kicked out myself from two of my own webinars, which I think is very mean, but it does take time for me to get back in, especially if my computer crashes, which did happen once. It can take even up to you know five, 10 minutes. So get a cup of tea, read a magazine, but know that I'm trying to come back, all right? Now also make sure you silence your phone, close the door so you can focus exactly on one thing and you're not multitasking because I've got an article on my blog about multitasking and how it dumbs you down considerably and a lot of other terrible things as well. So make sure you stay right to the end because I've got a great bonus and we're going to have the live Q&A and that's when you'll get your questions answered. Um, now sometimes the, the sound suddenly disappears too. In that case, just refresh your screen or even go out and come back in. I know this has happened when I've been on other people's webinars and that's what I do to get the sound back. All right, today I'm going to teach you how to wrangle this demon called irritable bowel syndrome into submission and kick it into touch. There are six elements I want to go over with you to get you on the right track. And these days, it's completely ridiculous for anyone to be suffering from the symptoms of IBS, diarrhea, constipation, bloating, cramping, because your, your gut's all wonky. So let's spread this information and get everybody sorted. Right. We know about the low FODMAP diet. It's a complex diet. And I'm going to give you some elements to help you with that. But first of all, I mean, not all of you will know who I am. Um, so many of you will know from my blog, Strands of My Life, but some of you won't. So my name is Suzanne Pirazzini, and I've suffered from IBS all my life. I can remember even as a child being obsessed with the toilet. And by the way, that's one of the first signs that you've got IBS. And I always spent ages in there trying to do my business, and I couldn't understand how my sisters ran in, and then they were out again and it was all over. And I'm still envious of those people who can do it fast because, and I'll probably say this again, there's no cure for IBS. We have IBS. We can control the symptoms, but we can't make it go away, unfortunately. All right, I mean, I, I wish it was otherwise, but there's a lot of things that I wish in my life, and one of them is that I could sing, but at the moment when I sing, I scare small children and animals, so we're not going to be doing that. Anyway, so I spent decades obsessed with the toilet. And I'd say no to invitations that might expose my secret because believe me, this is a secret affliction and it's embarrassing. So I went to, like all of you, lots of health practitioners from the medically qualified to the more bizarre end of the spectrum with voodoo practices in an attempt to work out why I was so different from everybody else. And none of them had an answer, even though, of course, they all had an opinion. I mean, when you pay money, and I spent a lot of money, probably like you, on this IBS, but then they feel obliged to give you an opinion and throw some medication or some obscure herbs at you. I mean, the number of times that I should be heard that I should be eating more fruit, more vegetables, more fiber, I couldn't count on both hands and toes, the toes and the fingers. I just, I've heard it all my life, especially the fiber. And of course, we now know that's the worst advice of all. But I kept going and trying over and over again. And 
they say that if something is not working, then change it. Don't ask me why I didn't change it for so long. I guess I believe that they knew more than me. But I was wrong. And in the end, I had to do it by myself and thank heavens for the invention of the internet, which came about 1990. So it's not been around that long. So I Googled and Googled until the internet over the years caught up with what I needed. And eventually I heard about the low FODMAP diet. And at first I ignored it, of course, like most of you have more than once. Because this is a complex little beast to understand. I mean, give me lactose-free any day. That's easy. And I tried it for years. Unnecessarily, because I don't have an issue with lactose. And by the way, only 25% of people with IBS have a problem with lactose. It's not as widespread as a lot of people think. Right. I mean, give me gluten-free. Simple, cut out a few guilty grains and it's done. But FODMAPs are in nearly all foods. So we can't do a slash and burn on them or we're going to die from malnutrition. It's complicated. It's about good foods and bad foods, yes. But it's also about amounts, combinations and accumulation. And who's got the time to figure that all out? I thought, not me. And so I kept ignoring it. But one day, I was desperate enough to skid to a stop, and I actually read a bit further. And oh no, this is what I needed. Darn it all. It had to be the most complex diet on earth, didn't it? So I began a time of intensive research and experimentation, because this was before there was really anything out there. But I knew I was onto something, and I can be pretty stubborn when I get my teeth into something. So I persevered through all the hiccups and disappointments while I figured it all out. And now if we jump to today, my life has been completely revolutionized by this diet and also by other lifestyle changes I've made. I used to sit in a crappy office with a cranky boss giving me headaches, literally while trying to minimize my visits to the toilet, because that's frowned upon. Productivity is the name of the game in a corporate office. And now that I am out of all of that, the office and the IBS, and I can say that I was a mess back then, barely hanging on my, by my back, back teeth. And when you're in that type of situation, it's very hard to step outside yourself and actually see it and recognize it for what it is. And so you stay there much longer than you should, as I did. Anyway, I eventually sorted my health while I was still in the office. And because I was finally getting the nutrients from the food I was eating, instead of them passing down undigested into the bowel where they caused havoc, energy flowed back into my body and into my brain. And I was able to make the infinitely sensible decision to get the hell out of that office. So now I work from home as an online coach, teaching people how to implement this diet and also teaching people how to make the necessary lifestyle changes to support the IBS. They go hand in hand. And I help people every day to become well. And I work with people from all over the world. I've had clients in India, Belgium, Colombia, Ecuador, Switzerland, and of course, many, many, many clients from the US and the UK, as well as, of course, Australia and New Zealand. And I now live life on my own terms, and all because of a little thing called the low FODMAP diet, which finally lifted an impossibly heavy burden from my life. IBS. <coughs> Just having a little drink. And believe me, I can remember it all, so I know how you're suffering. Because if you're on this webinar with me, it's because you need to get help as well. And you need to get this monster off your back. It dominates your every 
thought, your every decision, as it did mine. And I know you want to be free of this humiliating condition and to be able to eat out with friends and family without either causing a fuss or being silent, even worse, and paying with a bellyache. And you paid for that bellyache too, if you're eating in a restaurant. So I know you want to be able to work, travel, and simply lead a normal life. And no, I would never go out on a ledge like that woman. That scares the heck out of me. But I mean, I get it. And it really is right there in front of you. If you find the time and the determination to take that next step and to do this thing. And like me, you're probably putting off committing because you're so busy. Maybe you'll do it when the house has been renovated, or the kids have left home, or after Christmas. Believe me, I've heard every excuse out there, and it scares me that people would want to stay sick. But we all have to be in the right place for this, and you'll know when you're there. So, I mean, at the end of the day, really, what's wrong with you? Why would you want to suffer even one day longer than necessary? We humans are so full of excuses why we shouldn't be taking action now. And we all do it, and it's even got a name, procrastination. And that's the scourge of humanity, along with perfectionism. But that's a whole nother story. And you'd be very surprised to hear how many of my clients are type A personalities, which is what perfectionism is part of being a type A personality. So I think there's a connection there. Anyway, all I'm telling you is that this can be done. I did it. My clients do it. You can eliminate IBS symptoms. Now, as I said, there's no cure, though. So don't think this is an elixir of exquisite delight. It's not. But we can control IBS instead of it controlling us, and that's massive. And you'd be surprised how fast it works if you've got the right guidance to not muck it up. Especially those of you with IBS with diarrhea, a few days and you're sorted. Constipation a little bit longer because we have to put a protocol on top of the diet to sort that out. Now I get emails every day from people who've tried the low FODMAP diet and failed because they don't have all the little pieces of the diet in place. And that's sad. I've no idea how many give up on the diet because they get it wrong. I'd probably be horrified because this can save you. This is not a fad diet without any scientific basis to it, like so many of the other ones out there on the internet. This is the only one that has been scientifically proven to work. The research team at the Monash University did a randomized, double-blind, placebo-based research study that showed that 75% of those with IBS are significantly helped by the low FODMAP diet. And even more exciting, a few months ago, the University of Michigan has just done their own comprehensive study and have reached pretty much the same conclusions. Not that I need any proof, because I am my own proof and my clients are my own proof. It eliminated my symptoms. But you might need that proof because I know you've tried so many things and nothing has worked. So why should this work? Well, I'm sorry to tell you that you do have to try one more thing. And I'm going to tell you the six elements to put this all together right now. Oh, just a minute, I've got a great bonus for you at the end so but i'll tell you about that afterwards so now let's address the six crucial elements for a successful low fodmap diet everybody can get the list of good foods bad foods hopefully from a reputable site by the way because about 90 percent of what's on the internet about the low fodmap diet is inaccurate so make sure it's a reputable site for that list of good foods bad foods but these things are on top of that okay so 
when you start the elimination stage, it really needs to be done 100% accurately or not at all. And I know that sounds dramatic, but this is not a diet like a lactose or gluten-free one where you can eliminate those two elements completely from the diet and you're done. FODMAPs are in almost all foods except protein, meats, and fat. So we can't eliminate them the way that you can eliminate the gluten and the lactose, or, as I said before, we would die. It is about regulating very carefully how much FODMAP-containing food we allow into our gut at any one time. Small amounts will be absorbed in the small intestine, but not large amounts. That excess goes off down into the large intestine, and that's where it gets fermented and causes our bloating and excess gas. So let's have a look at the first one of the crucial elements, and that is the amounts. So the Monash University, as I mentioned, is where the low FODMAP diet was developed and where ongoing research is happening into the FODMAP content of food. And that has given us an ever-expanding list of food they've tested. And there is a line they have drawn across the list. And I know mine side by side, but really I suppose the visual should be the other way. Those above the line are high FODMAP and those below the line are low FODMAP. And we can only eat those below the line. So in my picture to the left of the line. But that upper limit of low FODMAP before it tips over the line is just a line. It's not set in concrete for us as individuals. For example, because fructose is my biggest trigger, I can only eat about half the permitted amount of fruit before my symptoms are triggered. So you can probably start to see the complexity of this diet. It's individual and it's about testing, even while on the elimination stage of the diet. Of course, you only eat low FODMAP food at this stage, but those upper limits may be too high for you. So if you've still got some symptoms, perhaps lower them and see how you go with that, or lower the upper limit on one group at a time. Because if I had stayed with the upper limits of all of the FODMAP groups on the elimination diet, I would still have symptoms because I had to lower the fructose one. And once that was lowered, then my symptoms completely disappeared. So play around a little bit with that amounts yourself as an individual. All right, the next, the second element is combinations. So let's say you've got the amounts worked out, but you're still struggling. This is the next thing to look at. You make a mixed fruit salad for yourself with a banana, eight strawberries, 20 blueberries, and 10 raspberries. And you're feeling very virtuous because a fruit salad is healthy and you've stuck to the correct amounts on the list. But you get a gut ache. So why is that? It's because you've just made a high FODMAP mashup. You have added together the fructose and the strawberries with the fructose and the blueberries with the fructose and the raspberries, etc. So why do you think that's okay? One plus one plus one plus one equals four. So that's four times the permitted FODMAP level for that meal. No wonder you're feeling sick. You can't eat poorly all day or not at all and then pile all your nutrient needs into one meal. It just adds up to high FODMAP for sure. All right. So I hope that mathematical Equation one plus one plus one plus one equals four. We want one. So you have one vegetable on the lower carbohydrate list per meal. If you want two, you cut the amounts in half. It's simple. So now we're going on to element three, and this is all about meal spacing and size of your meals. We can't eat big meals because our gut can't tolerate it. But also because 
large meals normally add up to high FODMAP for sure. So we need to have five small meals a day and spread our nutrient needs out through those five meals. Now, since the health guidelines tell us that we should be having about five to six vegetables a day, but we know we can't have too many at one time in one meal, then we basically need vegetables at every meal, including breakfast and snacks. If we only ate three meals, we'd never get what we need nutritionally, and we would also be very hungry in between because we can't eat a lot at any one time. Hence the five small meals a day. Now, my suggestion is that you schedule your meals into your diary before anything else, and they stay non-negotiable. And eventually, this will become easier and you won't need a reminder because your body will know the routine and it'll tell you when you're hungry. Our bodies love routines for the basics of life, like sleeping, eating, and toileting. And that frees us up to live the rest of our lives more creatively. In order to work out that set in stone routine, you need to know that you have to space your meals three to four hours apart. We could stretch that to two and a half to four and a half hours if necessary, but we are trying to create a routine. And you must eat your first meal within 30 minutes of getting out of bed. And we need to leave the three hours, more or less the three hours, so that the motility cleansing wave can pass through the gut, but not much longer than the four, or all the digestion will be finished and gas will be accumulating in our digestive system. And of course, gas is one of our problems. So work that out to fit into your waking hours, but also make sure that you have your last meal at least three hours before bed. So you're not doing any major digesting while you're in bed. So eat within 30 minutes of getting up so that you don't get gas accumulating. You're able to fast overnight, that's okay. But once you get up, you eat. And leave that three hours at the end of the day. Now you can schedule that quite easily within that time. Schedule it to fit in with your lifestyle, but put it in place. Put it into your phone or into your Outlook on a schedule so that something dings and tells you it's time to eat until it becomes a routine for you. And it will become a routine. I never have to look at a clock anymore. My stomach tells me when it's time to eat. All right, moving on. The next three elements we're going to look at concern non-FODMAP gut irritants. Okay, so this has nothing to do with FODMAPs. As you can see, that's not the whole picture. As you will see, it's not the whole picture. Obviously, it's the main part. Without that, nothing else is going to work. But we do need to know about these non-FODMAP gut irritants. So the first of these is fat. Fat is a gut irritant. But the tolerable level will be different for each of us. We need fat because Every cell in our body requires fat, so we can't cut it out completely, and we can't keep it too low either. But there will be a fine line between okay and triggering your symptoms, and you have to find that line for yourself. It'll be different from mine, which is pretty low, by the way, um, and it'll be different from everybody else's. So a drizzle of olive oil on a small salad or your vegetables could be okay. But perhaps deep fried chips won't be okay. Also, if you've had your gallbladder out, and a lot of people with IBS have, either correctly or mistakenly, because the symptoms can be similar, then you have to eat a much lower fat diet than all of us, but I'm sure you already know that. Now, I never advocate buying processed foods because the additives are often gut irritants, but also they contain much more fat than you would imagine. Also, salmon, it's a very healthy fish, and I want you to have some, it's full of omega-3, but it's very fatty, 
and you will have to watch how much you can eat before it causes issues. So it's much less than what you could eat of a piece of chicken, for example. So just keep that as a little question mark when you eat salmon. Just see how you feel afterwards and lower the amount if you get symptoms. And again, nothing to do with FODMAPs because salmon has no FODMAPs in it. It's a protein meat. Also, peanut butter, it's low FODMAP, up to two tablespoons, but that amount would almost certainly cross that fine fat line. So don't let the FODMAP content dictate every choice you make in your diet. Be alert for the fat content. Now the second gut irritant we're going to look at is fiber. Now too much fiber can cause horrendous problems for us. And yet doctors still give us fiber su supplements to take. So please throw them all out and your gut will immediately feel better. Whether you have constipation or not, throw them out. So yes, we need fiber to form good stools so that they pass easily, but too much and it'll cause bloating. So we need, we need it, but we have to, once again, find that level that keeps our bowels moving nicely while not causing IBS symptoms. You'll get fiber in your vegetables, of course, so make sure you get your five to six a day, as I've said. Also, grains contain fiber, and grains like brown rice and quinoa will give you a good hit of fiber. But test them first in small amounts and then increase until you reach the, the level that bloats you, and then back off. Now, some of you won't be able to tolerate brown rice at all, and others will get away with the permitted one cup of cooked brown rice. If you've got constipation, the first step I suggest for you is to take one tablespoon of chia seeds, but soak them overnight first and have that with your breakfast. You can decrease or increase that amount as you need, but that's a good form of reasonably easily digested fiber. Don't get carried away with it. The first time I had it, I was on the paleo diet many years ago as I was trying to find my correct diet. And I found a recipe with chia seeds, it was a little pudding, and I ate the whole pudding and I sat in the toilet for hours. So too much fiber, it drops over that line. Now there are other gut irritants, but you probably have already heard of them. Caffeine is a gut irritant. So even though we are permitted a cup of coffee a day or a cup of tea a day, from the FODMAP point of view, that does not take into account the fact that caffeine is a gut irritant. Same with alcohol. We can have one glass of dry wine uh, because we can have 20 grapes and wine is made of grapes from the FODMAP point of view, but alcohol is a gut irritant. So again, you've got to make that decision whether you want it. Um, you know, put that gut irritant into you or not in the form of a glass of wine. So I'm not saying never drink alcohol again. I'm just saying be aware that it could cause an issue. Now the last element, element six I want to talk to you about is your own personal gut irritants. Like about 20% of my clients have their own little baggage of food issues that are really outside the scope of FODMAP or even the above irrit irritants like with the fat and the fiber, etc. So these have to be pinpointed very carefully. So first of all, you do everything else I've said perfectly. And then if you've still got some issues, you really need to be a detective to work out what's still irritating your gut. Now, the other 80% of people will be symptom free at this stage if they've managed to get all their ducks in a row but these 20% will still have issues. So I've had so many clients now passing through my coaching program that I see some common threads of triggers. But then something surprises me. So the sky's the limit on this. But a, a few of the really common ones are the casein in dairy, which is the protein, um, protein part, as opposed to the lactose, which is the carbohydrate part. 
okay? So we're not worried with IBS about proteins on the whole, but some people, some of my clients have had a casein issue. In that case, all the, the dairy, of course, has to be taken out. Now, it could be the salicylates in nuts and in seeds. They are the part, because the seeds and the nuts are the reproductive part of the plant, and the salicylates are kind of a toxin that stops animals from eating too much, because if they eat too much, then the plant won't be reproducing in the rate it wants to. And we're animals, so we can be affected by these toxins too. So it's never a good idea to eat too much. But anyway, we are limited by the FODMAP content of both seeds and nuts. Just having a drink. So I've had quite a few clients <clears throat> within that 20% actually have an issue with the nuts. One other one is spinach. It has oxalic acid and not everybody that doesn't agree with everybody. But the list is long. You'll, while you're doing this, you'll have to stay on the elimination diet and then just take things out one at a time until you hit the culprit. So if you take something out and it doesn't change, take out something else until you hit the one that gets you to be symptom free. Then you can put the others back in. All right. And that's all before the reintroduction stage of the diet. So that there is the final piece of the puzzle for you. And it's a complicated puzzle to put together with a lot of moving parts, as you can see. But if you get this right, you will experience a miracle. No more IBS symptoms. But no one says it's easy. And now that you've got all that information, don't you dare make any more excuses that you can't do this. This will change your life. And it will change the lives of your family because don't think for a second that this doesn't affect everyone around you. I bet that you're a cranky pants most of the time because you're either in discomfort or in out and out pain. And you get your knickers in a twist about all sorts of things that are simple for other people, like eating out, going for a trip, work events. A client of mine, Rachel, said this, after some convincing of my husband, who realized how much I'd been struggling to find things to eat, I joined the low FODMAP diet program. And just the other day, he said that it was life changing for me. Calm belly, calm mind. A happy spouse. Who doesn't want that? So I want you to be able to go hot air ballooning. And there's no toilet in a balloon, and I know because I did it in Egypt, and it was fantastic, and I didn't need a toilet. I want you to go kayaking down the Grand Canyon. Again, no toilet. Mountain climbing, probably no toilet on the way. Or simply enjoying a family get-together, knowing that you won't get a bellyache. Really simple things. Sue, another client, sent me this email, and this is precious. I've been walking the dog without fear. Being fearless about going out is such a great feeling. I've been walking with confidence. Over the years, I've noticed my freedom slipping away and losing the ability to be outdoors has been a great loss to me. The freedom to be mobile again without fear is a prayer answered and so is this diet. I'm putting my health first, which is a rarity. I haven't felt this good in years. And IBS doesn't just affect women, though more women than men get it, unfortunately. But a male client also sent me an email expressing how much more freedom he now had. On Saturday, my wife and I took a three-hour drive to the ocean. This is the first drive beyond 45 minutes that I've taken in the last two years and the only recreationally oriented drive beyond 15 minutes. We are planning additional trips. I have much more energy. I'm working much more. I had a business lunch with a client last week and it went just fine. I could cry. Yep, I guess men cry too. And you will get worse, you know. You can't starve your body of nutrients for too long before a whole raft of other health issues raise their ugly heads. 
most of my clients have a long list of ailments that would fill in an encyclopedia. Things like fibromyalgia, um, reflux. 80% of people with IBS have reflux, by the way. They think the mechanism might be the same in both. Depression could be a good 70 to 80% of my clients are on antidepressants and anti-anxiety medication. Gallbladder issues are very common. Um, hypothyroidism is another one that's just come to me, and on and on and on. Not surprisingly, many of these issues start to improve once the diet is corrected and lifestyle changes have been made and you're absorbing those nutrients. Now, Sylvia Vincent, a very grateful client of mine, wrote this. Now I have a different toolkit that better suits the body. I've been able to repair and rebuild a very sick body, improve my mind, my mindset and family life. Saying I'm grateful is an understatement. And folks, this all works like magic when you get it right. Ed, a farmer in England that I worked with, wrote this to me after the program. I have not had any major IBS symptoms in the four months since starting the low FODMAP diet. To the time of writing this, I am a new man. And Kelly, one of my very first clients with Crohn's, wrote, I feel like I have all the weapons I need to tackle my digestive problems for the rest of my life. As I've said, this is a complicated process and you might feel like giving up and that's the last thing I want to happen. So I want you to have some support during this process. The IBS Insider Club is an information center I created a couple of years ago and it's grown enormously since then. It contains everything you need to know to stay knowledgeable about irritable bowel syndrome, follow the low FODMAP diet, work on balancing your lifestyle and staying abreast of all the developments in the field of IBS and the diet. Now there's a link on the screen where you can just read all about the club and you can join if you want to. So it's strandsofmylife.com slash IBS dash insider dash club. But let's just go into a little bit of what you will find in the club. You will learn how to create a personalized, nutritionally balanced, low FODMAP meal plan based on detailed examples and templates that I've got in there. There are meal plans for everyone, including vegetarians, those with reflux. Um, these meal plans take the guesswork out of meal time, and you'll never have to wonder if you're getting it right again. Now, you'll also get hundreds of recipes. They're all categorized in an easy to follow way. So if you want fish for dinner, you click on fish and you choose your recipe. If you have to bake a birthday cake, click on baking and find the perfect recipe. Now, all of these recipes have been created by me and tested by me thoroughly and my family. Um, these recipes mean that you'll never have an excuse not to eat delicious meals again. On top of that, you'll also find a um, hundred roundabouts, a bit under a hundred videos on specific topics about IBS and the low FODMAP diet. Now, these are videos all created by me and they can be found nowhere else on my public blog or on YouTube. They're made specifically for the club and they go in depth into how to follow the diet correctly in all its aspects and how to integrate this diet into everyday life. And I add new videos on a regular basis so it's growing continuously. And these will answer every question that you're ever likely to have. Now the club also contains almost a hundred challenges to get your lifestyle under control. I mean, we all live these crazy busy lives and feel overwhelmed much of the time. And that's of course a recipe for disaster for those of us with IBS. Each video is only a few minutes long, but will challenge you to do one thing for a week to see how that works for you. And in this way, bit by bit, you will piece together a life that feels more fulfilling and less overwhelming. You'll get back control of your life. The club also has a resource center 
where you will find a food chart, links to helpful websites, outside videos about IBS and the diet, links to the Monash University app and their booklet, and there's also a large research center where I post links to all the latest research studies on the diet and IBS. And if that's not enough to keep you up to date, I have a specific news area where I post anything that's breaking news. And if you want to keep up to date on anything else that's happening in our area of interest, I have a special section where I place links to articles that I trust, that I've read through and vetted, and that they only put things in there that add value to your knowledge on the diet and IBS. The articles cover a wide range of topics. And this means that you no longer have to wade through the myriad of inaccurate information out there, because I've already done it for you. I've vetted everything for accuracy and for interest. And just in case that's not enough, we also have a private Facebook group where you can chat, ask questions, and get support. This is an exclusive Facebook group just for my clients and for club members. So it's much smaller than my other free Facebook group. And in here you'll get my individual attention. So join the club to finally get all those messy pieces of the puzzle put in place so you can conquer your IBS symptoms once and for all. Oh, and remember the, the, oh wait a minute, I forgot about the weekly newsletter. Every week I send out a newsletter with anything new that I've put into the club and each newsletter also has a tip of the week and links of interest. Right. And remember the bonus that I spoke about earlier. So this is just for those that attend and watch the webinar. I'm going to offer you a special price of just $20 per month instead of the usual $27 per month. So that's $5 a week. And that will be your price for life and can never be increased. So just for that $20, you get all that information, meal plans, chat room, everything. But of course, you can cancel your membership at any time. And just to make the choice super easy when you join you'll get one free week and so you'll get one week in the club for one cent the system won't let me make it free any longer something's happened so you'll have to pay one cent and then you can get a week to look around and see if you want to stay and all you need to do is cancel your paypal payments before the week is up and you don't have to pay any more than that one cent so it can't get easier for you to make a decision than that. But the best thing is to hear from just a couple of club members. So Suzanne Williams said, I love the IBS Insider Club. The Facebook group is interesting discussions that I can relate to. I never have to worry about what I'm going to eat. I can check the recipes and meal plans. I learn so much from the news and articles. There's so much conflicting information on the internet on the FODMAP diet but I can trust the information in this club. Thank you so much for your wonderful brainstorm, Suzanne. My life is 100% improved, thank you. And Jan said, thank you for your professional approach to a difficult subject, IBS, and I've been a member of the IBS club since February 2015. Your knowledge has been amazing and I have learned so much more than I thought I ever could. I do feel fantastic, the best I have felt in my whole life, Thank you for opening up your life to us all and sharing your wisdom and knowledge of IBS. It can't be beaten. As I've said, just do this. Dive in and get all this information you need to sort yourself once and for all. This diet works when you know what you're doing. In the club, I only give you what works so that you can eliminate your symptoms in the shortest possible time while getting support in the Facebook group. So. Don't dilly-dally around because this bonus is seriously only for the webinar. Then the price goes back to $27 a month. So let's get you symptom free. All right, now let's move on to the Q&A. And I can see some questions already over here. Now I might 
see if I can get myself on the screen here while I'm answering this. That might be nicer for you. So pause the share. All right, stop share. So that stops. So now you can see my fixed picture. Let's see if you can actually see me. All right, so the that camera over there is working and this one is not. That's very bizarre. All right. Well, you've seen me now. I'm going to turn it off again because I'm actually facing the other screen and that's really strange. So let me pull across these questions and have a look. So go to the Q&A and put your questions in there if you have any. Now the Q&A, as I mentioned right at the beginning, could be under participants, it could be under more, or it could have its own little, own little box there. So the first question, ooh, can you eat einkorn sourdough bread even though it is an ancient wheat grain? Right now sourdough is an interesting one Irma, if the sourdough bread, it doesn't matter what wheat it's made from, if it's made in the traditional way over two days and has no yeast in it, then that's fine for us. We can have a couple of slices of that. Um, but a lot of the sourdough bread that you might get in the supermarket or even in a, a bakery, they cheat it and they put yeast in it to speed up the process. That will not be all right for us because the traditional sourdough bread is made basically from wheat and water and it's left to ferment and the wheat will naturally ferment over the two days and that means that the fermentation process has happened outside of the body so it won't happen inside the body but if they shorten that and use yeast then we don't get the benefits of that so sourdough bread made from any wheat over two days with no yeast is fine. All right, next one. Is they will the recording be sent out again? Yes, because I've recorded it and remembered to record it, and hopefully it does record. Then I will be sending that out to you. Vicky, I have actually been diagnosed with SIBO as opposed to IBS. I've tried the SED diet and it was disastrous and did not help. I've seen many sites online that suggest that the low FODMAP diet and just want to make sure that this will work for me. All right, so a few things here. First of all, the SCD diet is a very old fashioned diet that was created in the 40s and they didn't get it quite right. They did a really good guess at what our issue was with IBS, but they included fructose in the diet. So I suspect if it didn't, if it was disastrous for you, that maybe fructose is one of your big triggers. And also maybe you weren't getting it quite right. You know the six elements now that you have to look at and maybe you weren't taking those into account. So don't go to the SCD diet. I mean, obviously the SCD diet is still going to work for those who don't have a fructose problem. But the low FODMAP diet is the modern up-to-date version using all the knowledge and research they have now whereas that is from the 40s. Now SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, uh, is diagnosed with the hydrogen breath test and the hydrogen breath test is notoriously inaccurate. It's only about 50% accurate, so you've got 50-50 chance that your results were wrong. So many people who think they've got SIBO actually just have IBS, and I'm not saying just in that way because IBS is hideous. But the best way to know if you have SIBO or not is to do the low FODMAP diet. Obviously, accurately taking everything into account. If you have IBS, your symptoms will go away. If you have SIBO, they will not go away. And then you will need to have the antibiotics that are specifically for SIBO. Now, you can do it via herbs, but it'll take you up to a year for the SIBO to go away. So if you want to take a year to get better, you can try the herb way. The antibiotics will do it quickly, but you need to be at the same time on the low FODMAP diet because SIBO recurs over and over again, unless you're on the low FODMAP diet. That reduces the possibility of a recurrence. 
Right, I hope that has answered your question. Right, are you still all able to, to hear me? I hope so, yes, to everyone. Will you please put the Earl for the special group up? I didn't jot it all down. Okay, oh, you're testing me now here. Wait a minute, let's see. Let's get this down here. Ah, share screen. Go back to that share screen. All right, you should be able to see that link now. All right, on with the questions. You can, good. Can still hear me, thank you for answering the question about SIBO. Right, now Irma has a question. What would the protocol be for those with IBS with constipation? So the first step is to do the chia seeds that I mentioned. So a tablespoon of chia seeds in water soaked overnight just makes them a lot more digestible. Have that with your breakfast, that might alone might be enough. It's just increasing your fiber that bit more. If that is not enough, the next day, keep the chia seeds and add in some brown rice or quinoa to your day. Just watch with the brown rice, whether you're able to tolerate it or not. Quinoa is great in that it's not actually a grain, it's a seed and it's got a lot of protein in it. So that might be the best choice. So that's day two. Day three, try oats. Now, there's all, all sorts of different types of oats, so you might need to get the Monash University app to see how much, because the different types have different permitted amounts. But to be safe, have no more than a quarter of a cup of the raw measurement of whichever oats it is. You can then cook it in um, milk or water, or whatever you want, well, as long as it's low FODMAP. Um, that's a really good hit of fiber, but be careful again, not it doesn't agree with everybody, it might be too much fiber. But that would be step three. Keeping in always the step one and the step two. <coughs> All the time, make sure you're getting plenty of water, at least eight glasses a day, really important for constipation. I see an immediate change for me if I've had too little water the day before. And make sure you're exercising every day. You must get that body moving to get the motility of the, the gut working really well. And the last step, if none of that's worked, and sometimes clients have to get to the step, magnesium citrate. Now magnesium citrate is good for us anyway because we are naturally low in magnesium with IBS, but I recommend it for those with constipation because it has a laxative effect. Those of you with diarrhea, I would stay away from it. Start very low, even those of you with constipation, because um, it will give you diarrhea as well if you take too much, which is what I did the first time I took it. So start with about 100 milligrams. So I suggest you take tablets, you buy tablets because my tablets are 200 milligrams. I snack them in half, roughly, and then have one one day, one the next day. Start at 100 milligrams and build that up to, don't go much past 450 milligrams. So in other words, don't follow the instructions on the bottle. Follow mine instead so we don't have any disasters. All right, so that's the protocol for constipation. How many fruits per meal? Two fruits a day in separate meals, just the permitted amount. Okay. Turner, and read to fat. I've heard that if you have constipation, you need more fat. What do you think? Yes, you are quite right with that. Fat is something that we have to look at if we've got constipation, but again, we've all got that fine line. You go over it and you get the bloating and the cramping, and you don't want that. So it's like pushing up against the line with both fat and fiber, testing it, all the time. You'll know if you go over because you'll you'll get the symptoms. So yes, you are right there, Turner. Will the club offer info help with reintroduction? Absolutely. Absolutely. It helps with absolutely everything. And anyway, there's also the Facebook group where you can go in and ask questions about that and I can help you through it in the in the Facebook group. 
Is stevia a high or low FODMAP? It's um, low FODMAP, stevia. Just be very careful with it because the processing of it uh, is not that great. If you can find the plant in your garden, my mother has it in her garden actually, you could use that. Now also just check that the stevia in your supermarket doesn't have other ingredients that might be high FODMAP in it. They're not always pure stevia, so check the purity of it. All right, Veronica. Hello, Veronica. Okay, so I, you're just asking about the URL and I've put that up now. I've heard that it's not healthy, lacks proper nutrition to do the FODMAP long-term. Can you speak to this? Yes. So when they say that, they're talking about the elimination stage of the diet. It's better not to do it for longer than six weeks because when we're on the elimination diet and take out the high FODMAP foods, we are taking out a lot of the prebiotics from our diet. That's not probiotics, prebiotics. Prebiotics are uh, what regulate the gut bacteria. So obviously we don't want those out for too long. Six weeks is fine, according to the Monash University. So you need to get onto the reintroduction diet within that six weeks. And I've not yet had a client who has a problem with all of the FODMAP groups. So you will for sure be able to add at least one, if not two or three of the groups back in again. And that will get your high FODMAP foods back in. So that's what that is about. Don't stay on the elimination diet just because it's taken your symptoms away and you're feeling great. You will have to go through the reintroduction stage as um, unpleasant as that can be when you hit a trigger. You need the full knowledge of what's triggering you and what's not. And you put back in what's not triggering you, of course. All right, on to the next question. How much protein can we eat per meal? Now, protein meats have got no FODMAPs, so as much as you like from that point of view, but obviously there are health guidelines which say around about four ounces, which I think is 125 grams of protein meats a day. Some of the other proteins, like in nuts and tofu and things like that, have permitted amounts to them. So check all those in the app or the booklet, the Monash University. By the way, only use the Monash University app. It's the only accurate one at the moment. Irma, I try to make my own sourdough bread with a starter, so thanks a bunch for your answer. Great, that's exactly how you should be making it, with a starter. My doctor recommends the low FODMAP diet and I've been working at it, but also have been on a probiotic. Is the probiotic beneficial? Now, the, the research into probiotics is really in its infancy. They don't know a lot. And I've known people who think they're helped by it. The majority say that it doesn't change anything and some have been actively hurt by a probiotic. If you think that there are 4,000 different strains of bacteria in our gut and trillions of individual bacteria, how can they expect with one probiotic to target your individual issue in your gut? Because your gut balance of bacteria is different to mine and different to every other person's. So it's a bit preposterous to think that they can actually do that. The only time when I think probiotics are appropriate are when you've been on antibiotics. And the chemist or the doctor tells you exactly what probiotic to take to counter the antibiotic. And that works really well. But just willy-nilly taking a probiotic, it's not going to solve your IBS at all. And might actively hurt. Anya, is homemade yogurt, which has been 24-hour fermented like the SCD, okay? to get the good bacteria, as it says, there should be no lactose left. Now remember, we can absorb some lactose, we malabsorb FODMAPs, we're not intolerant to them, and that's why we can have certain cheeses, which have got a little bit of FOD, uh, lactose in them. So, yes, if it's fermented and there's very little lactose left, that should be fine. Again, it's controversial whether yogurt actually does anything to help our gut or not. Again, the, the chances of it balancing out what's wrong in our gut is very, very low. But lactose, I mean, sorry, yogurt has calcium in it, so fine. 
Cheryl, I have a combination of IBSC and D. Do you think this would be a helpful plan or would you need to be modified? I'm not sure what plan you're talking about. Are you talking about the low FODMAP diet? If you are, then a mixture of C and D is just the third type of IBS. There are three types, four actually in my experience. There's that with diarrhea, that with constipation, that mixed. I have several clients who've got it mixed. It's not that uncommon. And the fourth one I found through clients is where their bowel movements are actually fairly regular, but they have the bloating and the cramping and all the other symptoms. So definitely the, the low FODMAP diet is the diet for you. And you just have to watch on what side you're going. But normally those with the mixed, the low FODMAP diet sorts them without really having to put a constipation protocol in place. What is your view on drinking with meals, cold, warm, before or after eating? In the past, they used to think that we shouldn't drink with our meals, that it would dilute the digestive juices. They now know that's not true. So in order to get eight glasses of water a day, and just like food, we can't have too much at once. You can't sit there and drink a whole glass of water, or you could get symptoms. So have one with each meal and sip the drink all the way through the meal. And then have one in between your meals spread out over the three hours sipping it. So you're basically sipping water all day rather than going, oh, I haven't drunk enough and drinking a full glass. That could irritate your gut. Cold, warm, doesn't matter. All right, and I've answered the before or after part. How many proteins a day? Have protein with every one of the five meals. Otherwise, you're going to get hungry before the three hours is up for your next meal. Carbohydrates give you instant um, energy that then dies away quickly and that will leave you really hungry. So the protein is slower to kick in with its energy, but it will last the three hours. So you must have protein and carbs at every single meal to cover both of those, to give you a quick instant boost of energy and then to give you the long lasting energy. Is exercise as important for those of us with IBSD? <laughs> yes, unfortunately, Veronica, it is. <clears throat> I mean, obviously, far more important for those with constipation. But we know that exercise is a very, very important component of um, being IBS symptom free, keeping the body moving, keeping those parts of the system that only move when we move, right? They're not like the heart beating, which is automatic. There are various different things that only move if we move. So yes, and in your um, program, Veronica, you'll be reaching the part about exercise in week four. How much stevia should I use? Is this the same as sugar? Look, I've never used stevia. I've got no um, use for it because we can have sugar, right? And in limited amounts. And I'm talking about table sugar, brown sugar, cane sugar, all the normal sugars, because sugar has got 50% glucose, 50% fructose, and the glucose helps the fructose get absorbed in the small intestine, which is where we want it absorbed. It pulls the fructose through cell for cell. So if there's excess fructose, like in honey or agave syrup, then that excess doesn't get pulled through, goes down to the gut and gets fermented. And that's why we can't have agave syrup and honey. Stevia is also absorbed. But I think you only need to have a very small amount so it's super sweet. So I doubt that you'd ever manage to have enough to be a problem. Do you have the elimination diet on your website? I've got a food chart on my website absolutely in a few different places uh, and that, as I say is just the beginning then you take into account all the things I've taught you on this webinar to make the diet with the amounts and the combinations and so on. Actual meal plans are only in the club. What about taking digestive enzymes? If my clients are taking digestive enzymes when they start the program I get them to stop. We do not know um, what is in those digestive enzymes and whether that some of the ingredients could be high FODMAP. So no. Is it about four ounces of meat per meal or per day? No, that's per 
that's protein per meal. Um, so have protein at each meal, and when you have your chicken, meat, or fish, have four ounces of it. But you don't need to have a protein meat at every meal. No, you find out your own balance with that, what works for you. I mean, red meat, you only need it a few times a week. Uh, but certainly have perhaps chicken or fish at least once a day. And then you can fill in your proteins with other things like cheese or tofu or peanut butter or nuts and seeds. There are lots of different forms of protein. If I react strongly to beans, how do I get prebiotics into my system? Beans are not the only place that you get prebiotics, Lily. Uh, prebiotics are in a lot of fruits and vegetables and grains. They're all over the place, not just beans. I never eat beans. They do terrible things to me. Erin, I've been prescribed Colifac for my IBS and it does help mostly. Do you think it would be okay to stay on while doing the elimination? No, because you won't you won't be getting the right information about whether you're getting the diet right or not if you've got a Band-Aid that you're putting on it, which is what those medications are. So no, go off all that kind of medication for your IBS. Do not go off medications that keep you alive, of course, but anything for your IBS that's been prescribed as a Band-Aid. Um, go off those when you start the low FODMAP diet so you can see really clearly what you're doing and what you need to adjust with the different elements that I've mentioned today. Lily, do we always consume dairy separate from proteins? No, dairy is protein. So why would you have it separate? Okay, now I think that's all my questions. Well, that's nice. Um, your time and dedication will be sending you notes. Uh, yes, yes, you will be getting not notes, but you'll be getting a recording of this afterwards at some stage. I've, I've got to edit it, obviously, and it can take maybe a day, but in about a day, you'll get that. All right, that's the end of the questions. So I am going to say goodbye to you all and close out, pause the share here, and thank you very much for attending and I hope this has been useful for you. Right, you're very welcome. Everybody's saying thank you, excellent. Okay, I'm going to end the meeting, bye-bye.